All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Nikita Visniak with The Amazing. Dr. Catherine Chang. And today we're going to be going through some muscle testing review. So just basic process of muscle testing. And what do you think is the most important part of muscle testing? There's four parts. Why would you ever muscle test somebody? Number one, it's going to give you a functional screen. So if we're looking at functional screens, Bottom line is increased strength equals decreased risk of injury. This is known across the board and supported in all of the research. If you have more strength, your injury risk drops. Mm -hmm. And you see usually better performance, especially if you have better strength in areas where you are weak, such as end ranges or at the end of an event or whatever else it is, creating more efficient movements. Mm -hmm. But why else would we muscle test, Dr. Chung? Well, definitely neurologic, because you want to see if the nerves are actually firing into the muscles, telling them to actually move and create those actions that you want, right? So you want want to check for those motor neuron functions as well. Yeah, and that's a really good point. A lot of people forget, they think muscle testing is all just about the blinders of bias, muscle, 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 but it's also about checking the nervous system as well at the same time. What else does it give you? It gives you a diagnostic specificity. So it tells you exactly yep. where that injury is, the origin of the, uh, the anatomical structures that are actually being affected when, during an injury or during um, your, your assessment, I guess. And it'll let you tell the difference between, say, if it's a muscle, if it's a ligamentous issue, or if it's something else, even referred pain, something that's referring into that area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? Mm -hmm. So remember, it's also diagnostic. And the last one is, people don't even realize this, but your muscle testing is actually therapeutic. When you muscle test somebody, if we go ahead and muscle test her biceps right here really quick and she resists this and we do that what's she doing she's getting a little wrap off right there gonna get a little bit of gains okay yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. all right so yeah there are four main reasons why you'd muscle test number one functional screen number two neurologic screen number three it is diagnostic for tissue specific injury and number four it is also therapeutic when you muscle test somebody so if we move on, basics that you need to know, number one by far and away is you have to know your anatomy to do muscle testing. If you don't know your anatomy, you're in trouble to start with. And yeah, it's great, you can learn the basics from a book for origin, insertion, action, and nerve, but you also have to know what these things look like on cadaver dissection and unfixed dissection. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Chung and I did a unfixed dissection a couple of years ago. What were your findings on that? That was amazing for anybody who was involved with us there. It was actually amazing because we've actually done uh, cadaver dissections together as well a few yeah. years ago as well. And it's amazing to see the difference, just even the tissue perfusion, seeing the lymphatics that are still in there, the warmth of the body itself, and seeing how those muscles are actually moving. And unfortunately, with a cadaver dissection, you can't really see the muscle stretch or move as you move the joints itself. But with the unfixed dissection that we did, you were actually able to see the, the movement of the muscles itself. It yeah. was actually amazing. And what she actually did, which was super cool, is we came in and we did some electroacupuncture oh, yeah. as well. So yeah. you could see the muscles contracting and, and all of that. If you have never done it, it is a huge learning opportunity. Number one, if you can do it during a surgery, but number two, if you can have unfixed body temperature dissection done, it will change your viewpoint on what you think of the body. So that's part of the key part of the anatomy that you have to understand. The next thing that you need to know is biomechanics and lever system advantage and how you can use that to help give you better form when you're actually muscle, muscle testing somebody. You need to realize that this lever being long here, I can generate good force out there, but I'm checking a longer kinetic chain. If I want to be more specific, I try and shorten and be around the bones that are around that joint or around that muscle to test it specifically. Mm -hmm. And there's one other thing that you have to know as well when you're doing any type of muscle testing, which is? Of course, your own abilities. And that comes to knowing what your body, what your body frame is like compared to your patient or, um, or your client, and knowing how you're going to position your body so that you can actually get biomechanical advantage, just like Dr. Nick was saying about lever arms itself. Whether I'm going to hold on to uh, or create a longer lever arm for someone that's way um, different body frame and way bigger than I am, versus someone that's similar than myself, then I would create a shorter lever arm. Yeah, and that's why we're here because I'm 6'0 and she's 5'0. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at this, we want to show you different mechanics of how you'd move for different body sizes. All right, so what else do we have to know? Do you know, and let me ask you this question, do you know the three factors that determine your strength? Take a second, think about it. Do you know the three factors that determine your strength? Okay, those three factors are physiologic strength, neurologic strength, and mechanical strength. So I'll break each one of those down here a little bit with the help of Dr. Chung. The first one is the physiological strength. What does that mean? That means the muscle size that you have. Bigger muscles tend to be stronger, unless of course it's retaining water weight and we're looking at steroid muscle there, which tends not to be quite as strong, but that's okay, you can still develop good strength. Cross-sectional area available, so again, 
the bigger the muscle generally. Available cross bridging, if you're in the mid range of the muscle, they tend to have better strength. And the type of training that you do. So if you are training for strength and power versus endurance, this will change the contractile abilities of that given muscle and vary the number of white and red fibers you might have. But what else? If we're looking at neurologic strength, what do we get there? And this goes back to why we muscle test to begin with, which was the neurological function, right? So neurological strength just tells how strong or weak the muscle is, or the nerve is telling that muscle to uh, contract. And a great example Dr. Nick always brings up is uh, the, the mom when their child is, say, stuck under a truck or uh, in a car or something <laughs> yeah. like that, and then they really have to get them get out and save their child, right? And uh, they almost have that superhuman strength that you always say. And it's because the neurological uh, the signal is telling that, that muscle, I need to save my baby. That's I right. Need to get it out. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Yeah, so when you look at that's when you see maximum contractile forces are generated for anybody is during these emergency fight or flight responses that also involve, of course, hormonal interactions as well, but kind of a key thing to look for overall strength. And then the last one is going to be mechanical advantage. The force angle on the lever can create a huge variation, the movement arm length, and the joint capabilities. Now this is a bit of a pet peeve of mine. I've written to the Guinness Book of World Records a number of times. Strongest muscle in the body. Well, it's got to be the masseter, right? It's got to be the masseter. Yeah, that's great. It master does have good bite strength in a lot of animals, but what is it really? This is a muscle that's working with two masseters working together on the same jaw, plus temporalis, plus medial and lateral pterygoids. So you have multiple synergists creating the strength. So if you're looking at muscle strength, mechanical advantage plays a huge role. Guinness Book of World Records, if you're watching this, can you update just a little bit? Strongest muscle usually going to be in the body just by size, glute max or some of the quads, depending on how you define those muscles for most patients, most people. All right, so the key thing to get for muscle testing, it is a four-part process. What are the four parts? Active range of motion, then we proceed to a brake test, then we go to a concentric contraction, and lastly, we check muscle length with a stretch. Mm -hmm. So let's break those down a little bit. Yeah. Number one, active range of motion. Why do we do that? Well, we do that for a few reasons. One, just to really warm up that muscle itself, right? I like to call active range of motion, especially in muscle testing as the coffee of, <laughs> of uh, muscle testing. It's because you're trying to warm it up. You need that baseline, right? Your muscles are sleeping or cold, as we like to say. So to warm them up, you're moving those muscles. You're getting a baseline movement of how those muscles are working. And you're going to create that neural activation to really start waking up those muscles again as well. And this is a pet peeve of mine. You'll see a lot of people who use muscle testing and they almost sell it to patients like this. The first muscle test, they'll check and they'll say, oh, you test weak. And then they'll test you again after they do something. They'll say, oh, you see how much stronger you test? Every time you test somebody, the second time you test them, they will be stronger because of reactivation of the neural pathways and warming up of that muscle tissue. So you have to make sure that you do that at the start to, to get rid of your examiner bias when you're looking at the patient. I mean, ideally, we'd be using pressure meters and algometers to actually measure these pressures, but for quick muscle testing and practice, warm them up first with active range of motion. The second thing we do is a brake test. Can you take us through a brake test? What are the parts there? So there's uh, essentially you're, you're creating an isometric buildup of tension in that muscle. An isometric meaning that you're not going into extension or flexion, you're just going in one, you're holding that one muscle in place or that one position in place, and then you are gradually building up that tension, meaning uh, you're going to palpate, say, Dr. Nick's massive biceps here. Stop it. Okay, tell me more. Okay, yeah. And then um, <laughs> I'm going to go about um, 90 degree flexion, and then I'm just going to slowly add the 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 force and he's going to slowly resist that force and then I'm going to palpate just to see how much of the muscle fiber he's actually using and in this you would say how much how much percent would you say uh, I would say I'm giving you I'm giving you about thirty percent thirty percent because I'm yeah. super weak and he's super strong I'm okay sure. all right all right <laughs> okay um, and then I would gradually then add that tension and how are you going to build up that tension you're slowly going to increase that pressure and increase that pull and he's going to resist that force. And then now, what are you up to? I'm probably up to about 70% right 70%. now. Like I'm, I'm getting a little bit of a shake in there. She's leaning back with her body weight. Exactly. And you, that's where that break part of that break test comes from. You want to get them to a point where it starts shaking you at a little bit of overpressure on that, right? Yep, absolutely. And that's a key thing too for a lot of people, especially we see it in our students all the time and even other practitioners. If I'm going to muscle test, mm -hmm. if I muscle test like this, so I'm going to pull you this way, don't let me do it. She holds that position. What percent are we giving right now? 50%, 50 right? And when people do this, they think, oh, I did a good muscle test. But literally, I miss 50% of the strength in that muscle. If I really want to check it, I start off nice and light, absolutely. 
But what do I need to do? I need to gradually build that pressure up. So we go ahead and anchor in, hold that position. Just as a tip for biceps, I like to put my elbow into my hip right here. I'm gonna pull you like this, don't let me do it. Hold, hold, she's getting strong, hold. And right there, where the point where she's just starting to let go, we can see that that's going to be a way more valid test of that muscle to really see what it can do. People miss diagnostic information by not fully testing and challenging the tissue. Mm -hmm. All right, what else do we have to do? So following this break test, our next follow-up is going to be? Concentric contractions. And what that means is you're just gonna go through full range of motion as the, as the patient contracts their muscle. So what I like to tell my students when they're, when they're advising their patients how to, because it's a weird motion, right? Where it's just, you're, they're resisting your force, but then they have to go through the motion as well. So I usually just tell them, resist my force, I'm going to let you win. Yeah, so you wanna let the patient win. So it's enough to resist them, to challenge the muscle a little bit, but we wanna check it through the entire range to see how that person can really move around there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what do we finish off with? Uh, just like any exercise, you want to finish off with a stretch. Just to really uh, find the, the full length of that muscle, see the flexibility, and you can go into passive range of motion as well. Yeah, that. and passive range of motion with overpressure. So again, what are the four parts of this process? The four parts are number one, active range of motion to warm up, break test to actually check, and I would encourage strongly, pun intended, I <laughs> encourage strongly, okay, okay sorry, <laughs> that you have to go through that. And then you're gonna to go to a concentric contraction where it's let me win, so you're gonna let the patient win when they go through, and then the last one is going to be a stretch or muscle length check of that muscle, whichever one it's going to be. All right, the next part that's really important is going to be patient position and time. How long do you hold for? So let's go ahead and talk about optimal postures, especially why we have Dr. Chung here as a smaller practitioner. What are some things or tips that you would give us? Definitely patient position, how they're lying or seated, so supine, prone, if they're more stabilized and if they're more, if they're lower than you or the limb itself is lower than you versus um, being higher. Yeah, and those of you who know me, what do I always preach for all of our actions or for sparring as well? It is this action. Bring your hands in, strike zone, as long as you are. Okay, let's do it together. Strike zone, okay? <laughs> if you control this region right here, you are in a good position of power. So it, it makes you stronger if you can get the patient in that position. I've seen people do evaluations where they're working way up here or way down here. No, as long as you can be in this strike zone area, you have good strength and power. The other key thing is the instructions we give to the patient. So how do we tell the patient to move? Uh, especially with muscle testing, I usually tell my patients, don't let me move you or resist my force. I try not to say, um, put your force into my hand. Or push into or me. push into me. I never really say that because most people can overpower me real easily. Yeah, and right? I want to be on the other end of the room. And I've seen, <laughs> yeah, I've seen like uh, college level football teams. I can remember one therapist, she was doing this with a patient, she was testing his quads and it was, she was still new. Like, you know, everybody Everybody makes mistakes, of course. And uh, she goes, yeah, can you push into my hands with the quads? And, goes, and they literally just kicked her up and kicked her up and out of the way, so. <laughs> All right, so be aware with your instructions. Mm -hmm. The other key thing that we use for these testing positions whenever possible, I use these hands right here. These are my bunny foo-foo hands, okay? And I know it sounds silly when you hear it, but why do you go bunny foo-foo? Bunny foo-foo works because if I grip like this, people have a tendency to want to squeeze when they grip, and then the patient doesn't really know which direction I'm gonna pull them. If I grip like this, then the person knows that I can only pull you this way. So I'm gonna move you in this direction, don't let me move you, versus gripping like this, and especially if they squeeze, especially junior muscles, they grip that, you get that. Just not, a, just not a good technique to use. All right, the next thing is going to be time, and you actually wanna hold these for a good length of time if you're looking at doing good, solid muscle testing. So number one, hold for approximately five seconds, mm -hmm. right? Five seconds there, and you can repeat for up to three times to make sure that they don't have weakness. Conditions like myasthenia gravis can show up with that, where they'll test strong at the very start, but then on repeated testing, they'll get weaker and weaker and weaker. What else can you do with this timed hold though? How can we use this as an outcome marker? Um, well, you can see how many times they can repeat it, right? Like you were saying, the, re the re repetition of it will get weaker. However, because if you're, using, you're increasing those reps, they might have more reps over time, and then that's a great outcome marker to see how that muscle is strengthening yeah. and how that muscle is, um, is uh, rehabbing as well. Absolutely, patients and athletes love to know that they're getting better, and a great way to show them they're getting better is they can do more reps, or they can do more weight, or they can hold for a longer period of time. All three of those are extremely valid outcomes markers for you to use with every patient visit. All right, next thing is we have to make sure that we understand the strength scale, so we'll toss that up here as we talk through it. So on the actual video, when we get this edited, here's a picture of the actual strength scale. So a five 
out of five is normal 100% strength, and there, there you have good lock-in, and the person can hold with good strength. If they shake a little bit, that can be about a four out of or a four plus out of five. A four out of five is going to be good strength, about 75% strength. They can maintain their position against gravity and moderate force. A three plus would be the person is shaking a little bit with that moderate force. A three is fair strength, they have about 50%. They can move against gravity, but as soon as you apply force, they can't really resist you. And then we fade into two, one, and zero, and Dr. Chung will tell us about those ones. So two out of five means that there is some movement possible, but unfortunately they can't go against gravity anymore. Uh, number one, or one out of five, is trace. So there's some contractibility, so when you're, you're, ha you're placing your hand on the patient over that muscle, you can feel that they are contracting it a little bit, but there's not much joint movement. The muscle can't, isn't strong enough to move those joints anymore, so there's more or less a twitch. Yeah. And then zero is going to be non-palpable or um, contractibility at all. You can't really feel that anymore and it's more of that flaccid muscle uh, tone that you get. Yeah, and that's good. For those bottom two, especially a one out of five or a zero out of five, you're looking at probably neurologic injuries in most cases mm -hmm. unless it's a severe joint injury around it. Twitch response for a one, flaccid for the zero. All right, that gets you through your scale. And then we have our functional scale that we should use. Mm -hmm. So a muscle has good functional strength if you can hold it for five seconds and reproduce that for five to six reps. That is good strength. And we'll toss the rest of the scale up here so you can look at it. But at the end of the day, if you can only hold it for one to two seconds for one to two reps, that is going to be a poor muscle strength right there. But there are other better functional tests you can use as well, which include some other things like? Uh, plank time, so how long you can hold a plank. Uh, the, uh, the weight lifted, so how heavy you, the, the weight that you are lifting. Even a vertical jump and even rep numbers that we were talking about before. Yeah, and you want to choose things like how long can you hold for because these are simple things that patients can track on their own, especially isometric contractions. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to improve core strength or maybe you've got a patient with whiplash, Plank is going to be great for core strength. Why not just have that patient who has whiplash lay down on their back and see how long they can hold their head up? That's a thing that they can track over time. And the assessment is therapeutic. What you're having them do as part of your assessment is also making them stronger. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the key things to improve efficiency in any kind of clinical exam right there. Yeah. All right, next on the list, we've got a, an example for you that we'll go through right here. We'll go ahead and do a deltoid example versus supraspinatus. So how can I differentiate those two muscles? So for deltoid, we'll get Dr. Chung to do a quick demo for us on that. Yeah, so for this one, I know that there are three different hands to deltoid, and there's the posterior, middle, and anterior deltoid, and they all have their insertions either from the scap of the spine, um, the, no, the spine and of the scapula, scap, say, yeah. <laughs> uh, with the acromion and a little bit of the clavicle there, but for this one specifically, I'm just going to be testing the middle deltoid here. All right, yeah, and just to, that's, that's going to be your toughest differential is trying to figure that out from supraspinatus, right? Exactly. So. Yeah. Uh, so we know the supraspinatus, the, the degree of abduction is going to be above 15 to 30 degrees, so I want to be above that to really isolate that middle deltoid there. Um, in this position, what I can do is I use my other hand to palpate the, the deltoid itself to see if there's any contraction, and I just want the patient to hold here just to see if they can go against gravity, period, which apparently Dr. Nick can't. Yes. So given the difference in muscle strength that we both have, what I tend to do is I hold, I create that longer lever that we were talking about. About, and I like to um, add a little bit of overpressure and a longer lever to give myself a bad mechanical advantage. So Dr. Nick's just going to um, resist my force here and then we hold for five. I've got about a six foot three wingspan on my arms. I have next to no strength to hold her out there. You'd probably yeah. be strong enough even on the shorter lever. Yep. Yep. To go right there. Right there and then we're yep. going to push. This. Okay. It's nice to see um, that I can make Dr. Nick have that face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. never going to overpower him. Okay. Yeah. And then another way, if uh, you have, say, even a college level football player or someone that has a lot of muscle mass or steroid use, what we can do is get them to be on their back. And then I can use my leg and my knee, and he can just rest um, the, the arm onto, onto my knee here for a second. And then I can palpate the deltoid here, and then I can just put my body weight into it. I mean, be careful with this one, because you can definitely overpower the person. But you can just slowly add, um, add your body weight right there. And, and I got boom. nothing. Yeah. Exactly, right? And that's smart muscle testing right there. If she does that, she doesn't have to work. She could do that all day long and not wear herself out. Yes, exactly. Right? But the most important part, because you're, you're using your leg and you're not getting that tactile feedback, you have to have your hand over that deltoid or over that muscle so you're able to get that tactile feedback 
feedback to see if they're contracting the correct muscle. Yep, excellent. And if I was just to show my variation, it looks pretty much the same as hers, but she would just be sitting down on the, t on the bench right here. Uh, if I wanted to, because I was concerned maybe they had a weaker core and couldn't stabilize as well, I might just have this hand just put her on the side of the table so that if she felt like she was going to roll in or she could grab that side to hold herself back. But again, biomechanically, what do I do? I step in nice and close over top, palpate the deltoid. My hand is bunny foo foo hand going to be pushing down. So hold that position for us, Dr. Chung. Hold it. And then I like to give those positive affirmations to really get that neurologic engagement. Hold it. Hold hard. Hold hard. 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 All right, and then we can go through there. Short lever contractile strength is very specific muscle testing. If she did take her regular steroid injections though and was too strong for me, I could make the kinetic chain longer as long as she didn't have an elbow issue and I could push all the way through from out here. But even on this, I suspect this will probably work. Hold, hold, Sorry. yeah. <laughs> okay, so you can go ahead and see that as well. All right, now supraspinatus is kind of interesting for us to look at, so for supraspinatus, there's some uh, good research on that. Generally, 15 to 30 degrees is where you're seeing supraspinatus involved. But even there's a more recent article talking about the champagne position. I don't mind if I do, okay? <laughs> so you're in this position right here, and you're going to be lifting your arm up and out. So you're in that scaption plane right there, right? So we're just going to have our arm right here like this, holding that position. I can even palpate above the spine of the scapula and say, I'm going to push down into your arm. Don't let me move you in that direction. And again, look at my hand position. Hold, and I can push forward like this, mm -hmm. okay? So a nice simple test for supraspinatus versus deltoid. Again, relate it back to your anatomy. If you don't know your anatomy, these tests are going to seem like voodoo magic to you, <laughs> all right? But if you do know your anatomy, I can palpate supraspinatus or I can palpate the middle fibers of deltoid to see where the injury might actually be. Okay, next one is going to be latissimus versus subscapularis. Latissimus dorsi, what are the actions of latissimus dorsi, super doc? Latissimus dorsi does. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's going to be, well, I always just remember it as a lat pull down, or you're going to go into this, what's this, what's this? The handcuff, the, the handcuff, handcuff position, position right here. Yeah. So it does adduction, internal rotation, and extension. Yes. All right, I have to tell a funny story. Sonia, if you're watching this story, it was one of, the fav one of my favorite stories in all my decades of teaching right here. So I say to a class, I go, uh, so this is also known as the handcuff muscle. How do you wear your handcuffs? And so the student in the front row, what does she do? She's visualizing it in her mind and she goes, and she puts her hands up like this in front of the whole, in front of the whole class. And it was, uh, it was actually quite funny because so it was a hilarious little experience. But handcuffs usually, depending on what you're into, are more back and behind the back like this. So if you want a simple muscle test for this, what do we typically do? For if I was muscle testing somebody of Catherine's size, I would be set up like this. And I'm just going to stabilize on the inside of her elbow. Again, bunny foo foo grip right here. And I'm going to go ahead and stabilize over her shoulder because if I just pulled and I didn't stabilize, her body's going to lean forward like this. I want to stabilize here, and we're going to go ahead and lean back. Now again, I'm not going to try and power with my arm, even though I could if I was lazier. What am I going to do? I'm going to lean my body back while I push her this way. So hold that position. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Good power. Okay? That was a solid muscle test right there, and she got a little bit of gains right there with it too. All right? Now, for those of you who know me, Pull-ups are one of my favorite things. I love doing pull-ups all the time right here. So Dr. Chung is going to show us how she tests somebody who might be a little bit stronger than her in that action. So given Dr. Dr. Nick's massive lats, I know that I can't necessarily um, overpower him, although I love the, the way that Dr. Nick um, does his muscle testing, where he puts his body weight into it. It works a lot. It lo works great for a lot of people. This one specifically, because you're doing a lat pull down and you're really going down in this direction, easiest way to do it is for him to just uh, do a pull down into my knee and then I can then palpate over the lats here. Um, all the way from origin to insertion, which you might not be able to see on the camera there, but then he's just going to push into my knee and then he's just fighting against himself at this point. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yep. Um, and that's just a great easy way, simple way, and I doesn't really, if I have to test the lats all day, every day, 24-7, I can do that all day, every day, 24-7. On big, strong people. Another variation that I noticed that you like to do too, we'll get you to set up here again, was you like to actually plantar flex your knee as well, or sort of oh. plantar flex your ankle, right? Yeah. So, um, so that will allow me to, to create different angles and, and um, seeing where that lat is actually going to start um, contracting from. So you can go from a more stretched or elongated position or like about, I don't know, like 40% um, contracted position.
position as well. Yep. So you can change to see where that contraction begins. All right. The other thing that you can do too is let's say you wanted to have the patient better stabilized, they weren't moving as well, the patient can actually lay down. Mm -hmm. And what trick can you use again, Dr. Chum, where you put your legs in? Well, yeah. it's going to be in uh, this position. Yeah. And then, yeah, it'll be in this position. Maybe I'll do it on the other side so that you can see it from the camera there a little bit better. So if you're in this position, and then I can just use the inner th the, the the quads, and then and then Dr. Nick's just gonna push into my knee, and then I can just lean into that body a little bit. And you can't, yeah, but exactly. She's gonna. You can also see she's palpating with this hand right here. Mm -hmm. She can palpate the lat as well at yeah, the same time. Exactly. So he's gonna contract, and then I'm just gonna push against him, and then even if I really tried, I could definitely like overpower. Do it. Let's go. <laughs> 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 okay. But you can see that would be a full muscle test and how easy is that for her? That is super easy for her to do, okay? All right, now how do we contrast that with the subscapularis? So this is a tricky one because what is subscapularis origin and insertion? It's on the subscapular fossa running out to that lesser tubercle of the humerus. But if you look at the research, most of the research supports a test called the liftoff test that a lot of people do wrong. So what is the basics of this movement? The movement is hand behind the back like that and you want them to spin their arm out so the humerus does internal rotation to lift that hand off. How do people do this wrong? They do it wrong by this whole movement of the shoulder here. So technically my hand went off but everybody can see biomechanically how different that movement is. This is a full movement up of the scapula. This is a spinning of my humerus because of subscapularis and other internal rotators potentially helping a little bit. How do I add a little bit of resistance to that? We have the patient facing the opposite direction, hand behind their back, and from here, I just ask her to push into my hand. So can you push into my hand? Let's say, go ahead and relax. Let's say that you've got a patient who can't get their hand behind their back, and yes, there are people who can't do this. They can go ahead and they can just put their hand into their front of their stomach like this and say, can you push in like that? Or even better, she can put her hand in front like this. Mm -hmm. I can put my hand in there and see what kind of force they're generating. All right, so all of that is available. All right, so hopefully you found this useful. This is a basic review of muscle testing. If you go onto our website, we have muscle tables for all of the muscles of the body that you can use to self-quiz yourself on the origins, insertions, actions, and nerves, as well as pictures showing those muscles. We also have videos of every muscle of the body, how you would actually muscle test it in multiple different areas, palpation specific range of motion assessments, and even special tests for every region of the body too if you're trying to do diagnostic orthopedic testing. And then lastly, if you, want to, if you want to make sure you get your best use out of this, what do we have? We've got this little book, as I run around everywhere, we've got this little book called the Muscle Manual, used by hundreds of thousands of students and practitioners around the world that a lot of people find very useful. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Dr. Chung? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I, I use this book every oh, day. Oh, stop. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you like the content and you love watching us be silly, but also be very informative and educational, click the subscribe button and leave, leave us a comment to see, to let us know what um, more information or what other things that you would like to see. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for your time and we hope you found this useful. Bye.